Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now let's look at the nettlesome issue of race in America, how African Americans are represented, and what it means to be black in America today. A new book titled Black in White Space and written by one of the most respected scholars of sociology and African American studies, the Yale University professor Elijah Anderson, has emerged as the national conversation about race in the US continues to deepen. It's been described variously as a vital eye-opener, an unwavering truth-teller, and a must-read for anyone hoping to understand the lived realities of black people and the structural underpinnings of racism in America. But beyond shedding fresh light on the matter, does it also offer solutions, a way to end the persistence of racial discrimination in America. Well, for more on this, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined now on the line from Pennsylvania by the author of Black in White Space, Professor Elijah Anderson. Absolutely delighted to have you on the program. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, compliments of the season to you, sir. Now, looking at the Looking at the description of your book, there are examples you give of people in ordinary settings, but whose responses ev eventually involved the police and attracted national media coverage. And you argue that the reason is that they are black people existing in white spaces. Tell us more about your book. Yes, well, one of the important issues here, and it's very complicated, but in some ways not, I'm an ethnographer. So in doing my work, I watch what people do, and I listen to what people say, and I try to make sense of all that in real time. And so this is what I've been doing over the past years. And so the book Black and White Space is in part uh, an ethnography, in part it's an analysis of this situation that is so persistent, you know, I mean, typically right now, of course, it's complicated, but we've had, um, uh, you know, slavery, of course, which established the black body at the bottom of the order. And then we had the migration of black people to cities of the North and the South, and they were ghettoized, if you will. Now the iconic ghetto is important, you know, the place where the black people live, you know, and this is very important for this analysis because uh, that's a black space, quote unquote. Notably, white people typically avoid black space, but black people are required to navigate the white space as a condition of their existence. You see, this is very important. And where black people are burdened with a persistent deficit of credibility and encounter random disrespect and unfair treatment. They expect this, you see. Another thing is that black people, uh, the white space, particularly white people uh, and others who occupy that space constitute a major problem in their everyday lives, you see. And so black people approach the white space carefully. In navigating the white space, black people expect to meet at least three kinds of white people, those who mean them well and those who don't. And a wide swath of white people who, who, who they expect to be adversarial towards them and are pleasantly surprised if they are not. Typically, these white people who simply tolerate black people show little interest in wanting to know them and who, in fact, place them and try to keep them at a social distance. For black people, as they navigate white space with their social antennae on high alert, uh, the problem is to figure out and know the kind of white person they are dealing with or to know which is which and then to take evasive action before it is too late. You see, in other words, around white people, because of their implicit power in white spaces, black people manage themselves. For blacks in the white space, credibility is highly precarious. So in establishing their credibility, black people are challenged to prove that the negative stereotypes that white people hold about the ghetto do not apply to them personally, you see. And so what this means is that black people, as they navigate these spaces, you know, they engage to some extent in a performance. And some black people call this derisively a dance, you see. And the dance, uh, most often this dance is performed before a distant 
and unsympathetic audience. Distant because of the, 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 the extant racial divide and unsympathetic because the audience typically has its mind already made up about the black person and the threat they are assumed to pose for the white space or to those whites standing in judgment of them. Right. Well, I mean, that, that, that's quite a lot to, to actually take in. But, but I have to say that your, your thesis is as fascinating as it is disturbing. That central argument you make that white people subconsciously connect all black people with crime and poverty, regardless of their socioeconomic position and therefore avoid black space but for black people they are required to navigate this white space as a precondition of their existence i mean one imagines both black and white being actually quite paranoid as a result yeah yeah well i mean black people uh, i mean there's a master status to blackness you see and this master status supersedes whatever else a black person might claim to be, you see. And once the person proves himself as competent, as uh, decent, I mean, then the person graduates from this deficit of credibility to a provisional status, you see. And the provisional status simply means that he or she has something more to prove if a white person or the person stand in invokes that need, if you follow me. So this is, so the process is one of negotiation. Of course, there are black people who are walking and living in all areas of American life, but these people's identity to some extent is based on uh, negotiation and reminding the people who are there with them that they deserve to be respected, if you see. So there's a campaign that goes on, if you follow me. And this campaign has to do with uh, interaction and reminding people, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm intelligent, I'm educated, I'm this, I'm that. But at the same time, there's this 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 issue of, of performance, you see, and negotiation. Right. You see. Now, well, clearly, I, mean, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you again, but I mean, you, you, obviously, as, as you suggested, in that immensely oppressive, racially charged environment, I mean, those white spaces have opened enough for people like you to become immensely successful in your field. I mean, you're a professor at Yale, which is one of the world's top academic institutions. I mean, is that an example of success in the building of a new, more racially integrated America? Well, it's important to understand, I was born on a plantation, what used to be a plantation in the South. And my parents during the war uh, migrated to South Bend, Indiana. And my dad got a job as a factory worker. He was a fed up with great education. And I was educated in South Bend, 90 miles east of Chicago. At the same time, the civil rights movement was going on, you see. And as you appreciate, uh, this movement culminated in riots and political action all over the country. And at the same time, the country was involved in a cold war between itself and the Soviet Union. And many country, many, many uh, uh, colonial situations were be becoming decolonized, so to speak, and people were getting freedom and independence, you see. And they were determining which way to go, whether to follow the Soviets or to follow the West. Well, we didn't look very good in America because basically black people were oftentimes not allowed to vote. And so the powers that existed had to make America more like America, so to speak, as, 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 it's, as it's talked about. So what you had during this period when I was coming of age is a racial incorporation process, you see. And so the black people uh, uh, who lived in ghettos were, were encouraged to move into the system and we, were, we provided education and that kind of thing. I'm one of these individuals, you see, and I came into the system and I worked and I was able to navigate the system because of education and what have you, you see. And so there was the, the so that happened. And so what we have today is, is one of the biggest black middle classes in American history, in part because of this incorporation process, if, if you will. And for that to happen, there were many white people who were supportive. Don't right. get me wrong. But there were many white people who felt that their own rights were being abrogated, their own rights and privileges were being abrogated 
by the inclusion of black people, if you know what I mean. Right. No, but I that understand that. I, I know all, all the controversy around arguments and, you know, for and against things like affirmative action and all the rest of it. But, 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 but I mean, in all the extensive research that you've done, Professor, and in your personal experience, do you think you've found a way to finally heal America's racial wounds? Does your book get into that? Well, I think one of the issues here is education, you see. And my book is an attempt to educate people broadly about this problem, if you will, you see. Because uh, at the same time that this is going on, you see, there's a kind of browning of America. In other words, during the civil rights movement, we had a liberalization in immigration policies, you see. Historically, uh, immigration came from Northwestern Europe and places like that. Increasingly, uh, because of the liberation, the liberalization of immigration laws, uh, people come from various places where they were ignored before, Southeastern Europe, Africa, the Caribbean, Asia. These places are now sending people to America to become citizens, you see. And this has resulted in a kind of a browning of America in some ways. And so um, basically there are a lot of, uh, so that group that had been feeling that their own rights were being abrogated by the inclusion of black people, that group has grown, you see. And I would dare say that many of these uh, people support um, uh, restrictions on immigration and restrictions on black rights. And that kind of, this is what's happening in America right now right. today. Okay, I, I want to say that um, I, I think you've done an absolutely prodigious work here, and I would hugely recommend the book. It's titled Black in White Space, and it's written by the Yale University professor Elijah Anderson, who was speaking to me there from Pennsylvania. Thank you very much.